broadcast of Calvary Compassion Church. You're listening to Pastor Teddy Sanders. Let's join him as he teaches verse by verse from the Word of God. Have asked Jesus to teach them many different things, and and we know from the scriptures that they had already been sent out two by two, the disciples into uh, Jerusalem, but also Jesus sent out the 70, and he gave them power to, to cast out demons and to also heal the sick. But it's, 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 it, it, it seems that the disciples knew that there was something in praying. It was something that they observed and they heard Jesus doing when it came to prayer. Prayer is just simply spending time with the Lord, listening, listening, but also talking to the Lord. Now, what's interesting about this is that three years earlier, over in Matthew's account of the Gospels, uh, Jesus doing the Sermon on the Mount, he also taught them how to pray. And as they have gone out and they have experienced uh, success in ministry and advancing the kingdom of God, you know, they come back and they, Lord, we, we know that there's just something about prayer. Teach us how to pray. Now, over in Matthew's account, of the Lord's Prayer, that prayer was only 65 words, right? It was 65 words. And here, three years later, he's teaching them the same thing because we know that all of the apostles, the things that they taught was by repetition. It was by repetition. And sometimes you always, you may say to yourself, man, Pastor Teddy says the same thing over and over again. Yes, I'm going to direct you to the Word of God over and over and over again. So we see in Matthew's account, the Lord's Prayer was 65 words, and here it's 58 words. Why? Because I believe that as we grow in our faith, that the things of God become more simplistic. And so this is maybe one of the reasons why this prayer is as short as it is. One other thing, don't think that you'll be heard by God because you use a whole lot of words. Amen? Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2. It reads, Do not be rash with your mouth, and let not your heart utter anything hasty before God. For God is in heaven, and you on the earth. Therefore, let your words be what? Few. Let your words be few. And then over in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. And Jesus said this, And when you pray... Do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. And it's interesting, as you go throughout the Bible, outside of John chapter 17, most of Jesus' prayers were either one lines or they were less than 80 words. And I think that's a good example for us to follow. You heard me say last week and probably the week before, you know what, that I'm not a talker. And so, you know what, why should I become a talker in my prayer life? No, I'm specific and to the point. Lord, I need your help. Lord, I need you to intervene right now. You know, and and that's that's how my prayer life is. But I'm connected to the Lord all throughout the day, and I'm going to get there a little bit later. And so, you know, those of you who are talkers, remember that God knows your heart. And so if you're trying to butter him up by using a whole lot of words, save yourself some trouble. Save yourself some trouble. Just say what's on your heart. Because he already knows us on your heart. Amen? Now, prayer can also be simply that a child can do it. And I love to hear children pray. Right? It's so simple that a child can do it. But the enemy knows that as adults, it's the one thing that he keeps us from. How many of you here, don't raise your hand, wish that your prayer life was stronger? And I'm pretty sure every individual in here that is a believer and a child of God, we wish that's one area that we can be more strong in. You know, some years ago, my son Ethan, we got blessed with some tickets to the Rapids Water Park down in West Palm Beach, and Ethan was probably eight or nine years old. And uh, we had to use these, these tickets. This was the last day to use them. And so it was just raining, and it was thundering. I mean, it weather was just terrible. And, and Ethan was like, Dad, um, you think we're going to be able to go? I'm like, son, why don't you go into your room and pray and come back out and see what the Lord tells you? And, of course, you know, you think it's just like me. Well, he's a kid. He's going to come back out and say, yeah, we can go. So Ethan went into the room, and sure enough, he came back out. And he's like, Dad, he said, the Lord says he's going to work it out. And I'm like, oh, really? Ladies and gentlemen, this is a testimony to God and to the power of prayer of a child. When we opened the front door to our house, the rain ceased. We went to the Rapids Water Park. The sun was shining. And the moment we got in our car, guess what happened? 
the heavens opened up again. So simple that a child can do it, but so complex that the enemy knows that if he can keep us from praying, he can hinder us from advancing the kingdom of God. And so we, we have to remember that it's important that we pray. And listen, don't try to be someone you're not in your prayer life. Be who you are because God knows who you are. Amen? Now, let's take a closer look at this prayer. Now, I want you to also notice that these are plural pronouns, right? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us. And so everywhere throughout this prayer, you're going to see plural pronouns. Why? Because not only is this a prayer that we can pray as individuals, but it's a prayer that we can also pray for others by intercession. How many of you know you should be praying for others as well as yourselves? You know, there will be times when you're engaged in prayer and the Lord may have you praying for somebody halfway around the world that you don't even know, right? That, that's, that's how he works. And I'm sure that many of us are being prayed for multiple times a day throughout the day because this is also a, a prayer of intercession on behalf of all the other brothers and sisters around the world. Let's take a look at it. Our Father. Our Father. Say, Our Father. Our, our, our Abba, our, our, our Daddy. This lets me know that the, this is based upon relationship with the Father. It's one of spiritual intimacy and love as his children or his child. How many of you really believe and know that God really do loves you and he really do cares for you? Even if you growing up didn't have a father or you had a bad father, listen, he's going to supersede all those things. Our Father is based upon relationship. Why? Because you're his child and he loves you. He loves you despite of you. He loved you even when you didn't love him. Now that's a great God. The love of God. Over in 1 John chapter 3, I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. It says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, our father, our daddy. And you know, I struggled with calling a man daddy for, for a number of years uh, because my biological father was absent in my life, but the Lord blessed me with the wonderful father in Lorenzo Moses, and he never required for me to call him dad. That started as I got older and it was an adult. And so with that, it was hard for me to translate calling someone else daddy or father. And I had a tough time with that, but I tell you what, you know what? God just revealed in my heart because, you know, I used to always wonder why my biologic father chose not to be a part of my life. Once again, I didn't miss a beat with Lorenzo Moses. Every game, every word that I went, I look up in the stands, there's my dad, Lorenzo Moses. But even if Lorenzo Moses had not been there, my heavenly father was always there. He never missed a game, never missed a day when I was in the hospital, never missed a day when I was injured. He's always been there. He's not only my heavenly father, but he is your father as well. And he loves you because he loves you. There's nothing that you can make him, make him to love you anymore, and there's nothing that you can do to make him love you any less. He's our father. And where is he? The scripture says, in heaven. Our father in heaven. This speaks of God as majestic and transcendent, transcendent throne of God. Psalms 11 verse 4. Psalms 11, verse 4. It says, The Lord is in this holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold and his eyelids test the sons of, of men. Our Father, relational, who art in heaven, his abode. And then Psalms chapter 115, Psalms 115, verse 3. Now, if you all get this verse down into your spirit, man, it will help you in every situation that you find yourself in. Highlight this in your Bibles if you haven't. Put it to memory if you haven't. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to free a lot of people because it freed me. You know, oftentimes we ask, why did this happen or why did that happen when things go on in our lives, right? Here's the verse right here that you need. Psalms 115, verse 3. But our God is in heaven. 
He does whatever he pleases. And that's that. He's in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Right? Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. The name of the Lord is holy. The name of the Lord is holy. Holy is the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 6. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 6. It says, Inasmuch as there is none like you, O Lord, you are great, and your name is great in might. Holy is the name of the Lord. He's holy, he's righteous, he's just. And the list goes on and on. Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. Now, think about this. Before I read this, this, this scripture, this verse of scripture, think about how holy the God is, right? Listen to the scripture. Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. It says, The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night. Picture that. They do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. Our God is so holy, he's so righteous, that the angels declare day and night, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Listen, we as his children, we are privileged that the scripture teaches us in Hebrews that we can approach the throne in our time of need to obtain grace and mercy, right? We can approach the throne anytime, anywhere we choose. But listen, don't get so complacent in your relationship with the Lord that you begin to refer to him as the big homie or, you know, the big cheese or the big guy. Listen, I tell you all this all the time. This is not the Wizard of Oz that you are approaching. This is a holy and righteous God. And folks kill me. They're like, you know, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God this. I'm going to ask God that. Sure you will as soon as you get up off of your face. Because when you look throughout Scripture, when, and when humans just had an encounter with angelic beings, the first thing they did was hit their face. Now, if that's just an angel, how much more so you think we're going to be on our faces when we are in the presence of the living God? He is holy. And although we can benefit by, by going before him, going before his throne to obtain grace and mercy, listen. Make sure that you bring that reverence with you. This is just not any other individual. This is not a court. This is not, you know, a high official. This is the creator of the universe. He's holy and he is righteous. And then he goes on to say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, what this means is that this is the rule of God in the earth as it is in heaven. Remember, we've been studying uh, uh, Luke chapter 9 and chapter 10, where it talks about advancing the kingdom. Where is the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of heaven, as children of God, is wherever we are. Why? Because we are repentant sinners that have been saved by grace through faith. Therefore, the spirit of the living God abides in us, and everywhere that you and I go, we take the kingdom of heaven with us. The Bible teaches us that uh, greater is he in us than he who is in the world. And you know what? Everywhere we go, we should be advancing the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. And do you all remember this? This is what John the Baptist had to say. He says, repent. Why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why? Because he knew that the Messiah was there in his presence. Right? And we as believers, we've been blessed to have the spirit of the living God to abide in us. And so we can actually say, Lord, your will be done in me and on the earth as it is in heaven. Why? Because we are repentant. We are acknowledging that he is God. We are acknowledging that he is all that we need. And when we go wherever we go, the kingdom of God goes with us. And then he goes on to say here, give us this day our daily bread. Note, the Lord supply all of our needs and not our greeds. The Lord supplies all of our needs and not our greeds. The Apostle Paul to the Philippians in chapter 4, verse 19. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. 
And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The Lord will supply all of your needs. You know, sometimes as parents and even more so as grandparents, we know when our kids or our grandkids need something, right? There are times when we just, just bless them out of the abundance that the Lord has blessed us with. But then there's times when you know that there's a need and you're just waiting for them to ask. Anybody else like that? As a parent or grandparent? There are times that my kids, you know what? I, I've been blessed with abundance and I just, I just bless them. And then there's times, you know, when they come and you know how they do us. You know, they're, oh, dad, you're the best dad in the whole wide world. And, you know, they're, man, I tell you, I just really want to thank you. Uh, you know, can, can I borrow, you know, $25? You know, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's the same way with our Lord. He says that we have not because we ask not. And so, yes, he knows what you need even before you ask, but sometimes you have to ask. And there's nothing too hard for the Lord to do as it pertains to your needs. And you know what? He's so good and he's so gracious to us. There are going to be times when he may bless you with some of the things that you may want. That's the type of God that we serve because none of us, are worthy of any of his blessings. But because of his grace, his mercy, and his love toward us as his children, he wants to, to bless us, and he does. Then he says, lead us not into temptation. Now, temptation here uh, means enticement or a test or a trial. It is not always uh, something leading to, to sin. And what you and I also have to understand is that the Lord does not tempt us. The Lord does not tempt us. Over in James chapter 1, James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. It says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But get this. Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by what? His own desires and enticed. Verse 15. Then when desires has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So God does not tempt. You know, we are tempted because, number one, we have an enemy who knows us backwards and forward. You know what? But there's a great promise that the Lord gives us when we are faced with temptation. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Now, a lot of times this verse is taken out of context, right? Because how many of us have heard the Lord will not give you more than you can bear, right? We, anybody been around our church and you heard that phrase? That's not truth. That's not truth. This is what it actually says. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. See, we no longer can use that old Flip Wilson cliche, the devil made me do it, right? Anybody remember Flip Wilson? Uh, I'm dating myself a little bit, huh? But we, we can't use the devil made us do it because God says when we are tempted by the enemy, the Lord always provides a way of escape. And so you need to put this into your memory bank. You need to let this saturate your heart, knowing, number one, that God does not tempt. We are tempted by the adversary. Or we're tempted by our own desires that are not Christ-like. But God says that with every temptation, he always provides a way of excuse. And think about that. There are some things that I have done in my life that I am ashamed of. And when I, when I go back and I revisit the situation, God always provided a way of escape. Always. Whether it was a, a, a word from another brother or sister, or whether it was conviction of the Holy Spirit. And, and you know what happens is when we're faced with temptations, right? And you know our flesh wants to engage. You know, as believers, the Holy Spirit, he starts out by screaming at us, no, no. And then I'm sure he gives us the word that says, watch, no, 
right? And as you and I continue to debate that thing, you know, after we know that it's a no and we continue to debate it, well, you know, it, it, it's, it's not really that bad, right? And then that voice of conviction be, becomes a little less faint. No. No. And this is why according to the Word of God, right? And then we continue to, to wrestle with that thing, right? When we know that it's wrong, and then that voice is simply, no, no. And then we, when we give over into our desires, guess what? You don't even hear the voice of the Holy Spirit anymore. And then when all Hades breaks loose in your life, right? And you're wondering why, God, why did you allow this to happen to me? Well, you know, I gave you several warnings. I gave you my spirit that convicts you. I sent word through another brother or sister. I sent word through a, 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 a road sign. Whatever it is, God always provides a way of escape. And so we just have to be careful in those things. And then he goes on to say, and forgive us our sins, for we also give everyone who is indebted to us. Plainly speaking, don't look to be forgiven if you're holding forgiveness from someone else. Why? Because when you hold for forgiveness from someone, you are placing yourself in the realm of God. Who are you not to issue forgiveness to someone when you want the Lord to forgive you. He goes on to tell us in Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, and this is that part of the prayer in Matthew. He says, for if you forgive me on their tra tra trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive me on their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. As believers... We are to forgive those individuals that has done us wrong. You know, oftentimes I hear this. Well, I forgive, but I can't forget. Well, the Lord never asked you to forget. He only asked you to forgive. Amen? And so, you know, I'm not saying that it's easy, but I'm telling you that it's necessary. We have to forgive those individuals that have done us wrong or hurt our feelings. Listen, because I don't want to ever be put in a position to where I'm walking around here with unforgiveness in my heart, thinking that I'm right with God. Because you have deceived yourself and you're not in a good place. Listen, when it comes to forgiveness, and I, I get this question all the time, well, what does it look like? It looks the same way that it does with you and, your, and our Lord. Is that he says that, you know what, as far as the east is from the west, he remember our sins no more, right? Not that he forgets about them, what he does is he don't let those things impede us moving forward. And so when you're dealing with forgiving an individual, yes, you can forgive him. And you know what? Their actions are now upon them. You know what? If I forgive my wife for something that she done for me, or did to me, listen, the guilt is out of my hands now. It's not, it's not my responsibility that she receives that forgiveness or not. It has been issued. How do I issue forgiveness? Sweetie, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Can you forgive me? And if she says no, now that's between her and God. All right? And then what happens is, even if she hasn't forgiven me, I'm not going to let that impede how I treat her. And I'm using the relationship between husband and wife, but it, it applies to every relationship that we have. And once again, when I stand before God, he's not going to ask me about anyone else other than me. And when you stand before the Lord, he's not going to ask about anyone else other than you. And so don't let an individual or a group of individuals prevent you from missing your blessing of enjoying that relationship with the Lord. Amen? And then he goes on to say, but deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from the evil one. Over in Luke chapter 22, verse 31. Luke chapter 22, verse 31. And we know this is what Jesus said to, to Peter. And he said, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. And then he goes on to say, but I have prayed for you. And listen, the enemy desires to sift us like wheat, but God has prayed for us. God intercedes on our behalf. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession on behalf of the saints. Who are the saints? We are the saints. Listen. If God be for us, who can stand against us, right? If God be for us, who can stand against us? Yes, we face a foe who is formidable, but he is a defeated foe. 
Jesus said that the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. That is a promise, not for heaven, but for now. And if you're not experiencing abundant life, and listen, abundant life is not about possessions. Abundant life is not about possessions. Abundant life is to enjoy a relationship with the Lord here and now. He's going to provide the things that you need. He may grant you even some of the things that you want. But don't be due thinking just because you don't have material blessings that God has somehow turned his back on you. No, he has not. It's not about the possessions. It's about the position, the position that we are in as his children. Remember, we are not fighting for victory. We are fighting from victory. Victory is ours. Jesus said that he made a public spectacle out of Satan over in the book of Colossians. He has nailed the, 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 uh, the thing to the wall, right? And so we are victorious, and we can experience that abundant life here and on earth. And like Peter, there are times that our faith may falter, but it will never be destroyed. Just like Peter. His faith faltered, but he was never destroyed. And Peter learned this lesson. Peter learned this lesson over in 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 9. He says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. And Peter learned that lesson, and that's a lesson also for us. Listen, cast your cares upon him, the Lord, because he cares for you. And then he says, be sober, be vigilant, because our adversary is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He may be a roaring lion, but God has snatched out all his teeth. Amen? We are victorious in Christ Jesus. Amen? Now, a couple of things. When should we pray? All the time. Paul instructs us in 1 Thessalonians verse 5, chapter 5, verse 17, I'm sorry. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, he says to pray without ceasing. Now, a lot of times what's happened is, you know what, you all are probably like me, you know, like, how in the world can I pray 24-7, 365? No, that's not what this, this verse is actually teaching. This verse is actually teaching that, you know, we are to be in constant fellowship with the Lord. 24-7, 365. And when you and I are in constant fellowship with the Lord, we can have those conversations anytime, anyplace, anywhere, which is called prayer. Pray without ceasing. You know, when you go throughout the Bible, you will see uh, just you, you, all throughout the Bible, the, the most powerful prayers was the shortest ones of all. Remember Nehemiah? Remember ne Nehemiah had to go before the king? And, you know, he was concerned about Jerusalem, and, you know, he had been praying and fasting, and then he presented himself to the king, and the king was like, hey, hey, Nehemiah, what's going on? I can tell something wrong with you. That quick prayer, boom. Jesus, Father, not my will be done, but yours. Boom. Raising Lazarus from the dead. Lord, I know that you hear me, that you always hear me. Show yourself to these individuals. Those short prayers are powerful prayers. Now, if you're a talker, you, that's between you and God, all right? But listen. Don't think just because you use a whole lot of words that you're going to get a whole bigger response than what you normally do if you just shouted a sentence. Pray without ceasing just means to continually be in fellowship with the Lord and talk to him all throughout the day. Amen? And then you have to know that the word and prayer go hand in hand. That's why it is important for you to know the word of God for yourselves. Sunday morning should just not be the only time that you are studying the Bible and studying the Word of God because for every problem you have, there's a promise pertaining to it in the Word of God. And Jesus told us in John chapter 15, verse 7, John chapter 15, verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Here's the thing. Father, your will be done. And see, what happens is when we really submit and we really believe that, listen, you're going to pray the things that Jesus would pray. And when you pray the things that Jesus would pray, the things are going to happen for you. 
Now, there are some things that, you know what, are, are gray areas. You know what, you, you know what, you have an opportunity to, to purchase a home. You know what, hey, submit that before the Lord. Ask the Lord to bless you with favor. Ask the Lord, you know, that if he does decide to bless you with this home, that you're going to use this, this home for his glory. You know what? And, and, and that's what happens when our desire is his desire. When his will is our will, he hears and he answers. And, I would, and I'm telling you, when you pray, use the word of God. Use the promises that he has given to us, and you will see a difference in your prayer life. Now, as it relates to prayer, I like to use the acrostic acts. How many of you have heard about that? Acts. If you haven't, write this down. This is how, this isn't the only way, but this is just one way, okay? And it's the, the, the word acts, A-C-T-S. The A stands for adoration or praise. The C stands for confession, a time of repentance, right? You repent of your sins. The T stands for thanksgiving. You know, you're thanking the Lord for all that he has done and all that he will do. And then you have the S, which stands for supplications. And this is your petitions and your requests and also intercession on behalf of others. Just a simple ask. Now, what I do, I do it just a little bit different. I pray cats, right? I just reverse the C and the A because I like to start with confession. I like to ask the Lord to forgive me of my sins. Why? This is why I do it that way. Over in Psalms chapter 66, verse 18, 66 verses 18 through 20. This is why I start with confession. It says, if I had not confessed that the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Right? And so if you are harboring on some type of sin and you haven't repented of that sin, your prayers are just bouncing off the wall. God doesn't even hear them. He says, but if I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God did listen. He paid attention to my prayer. Praise God who did not ignore my prayer or withdraw his unfailing love from me. And, and so what I do is, you know, I start off with confession. I ask the Lord to forgive me for those things that I may know that I've done wrong, those things that I may not have known, you know, that I've done wrong. I just ask the Lord to cleanse me. Lord, created me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Father, although my, my sins come across as, as crimson, Lord, you shall make them as white as snow. And what I do is I, I pray a heartfelt prayer of confession, but I also give the Lord's back his word as it relates to my sin. Lord, you say that you have tossed my sin into the depths of the sea. You said as far as the east is from the west, Father, you remember my sin no more. Lord, forgive me for X, Y, and Z. And then I move on into the adoration. And what I like to do is I like to go through the alphabet. Lord, I adore you. Lord, you are beautiful. You are caring. You are delightful. You are eternal. You are faithful. You are glorious. Lord, and, and I just go all the way through the alphabet, maybe once or twice, you know, and what it does, it, it prepares my heart, you know, for the actual prayer time that I, that I have with the Lord. And then, you know, I just go through the rest of the prayer. And you know what? There's times that, you know, I break it up. You know, in the morning, I may start with confession. You know what? And then a little later in the day, I, I start with thanksgiving and adoration. And it's not at all at one time that I do these things. I do them throughout the course of the day. But I'm always fellowshipping and a communion with God. And, you know, I talk to the Lord throughout the day. You know, sometimes my wife, she's like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, I wasn't talking to you. Right? Because, you know, it's, it's important that we stay in fellowship with the Lord. And listen, this is the hardest area that the enemy combats all of us because he knows that there is power in prayer. There is power in prayer. And listen, hey, if you, if, if you want your, your, your prayer life to be vibrant, hey, you know, do something that you can engage in. You know, the Lord at the same time, you know, like Paul and Pastor Paul and Linda, you know, they, they do their prayer walks right? And, you know, others do different things. You know, you may worship and pray. You know, there is no one way. You have to do what works best for you. Amen? And so, what I just presented before you, the, 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 uh, the acrostic acts is just one way. It's not the only way. But it's a blueprint on how to have a more vibrant prayer life. But the, but the biggest thing is you have to make sure that you connect it to the Father. You have to make sure that, you know what, Jesus is your Lord and your Savior. Jesus 
came to this earth. He was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross of criminal's death. He was placed into a borrowed empty tomb. And we know that on the third day, he arose with all power and authority. And then he says, you know what? He says, I have to, I have to leave you. I have to go to the boat of heaven. You know, and the scripture tells us that he is now seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession on our behalf, the saints, right? And then he says, but I tell you, I tell you what, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to give you the comforter, the Holy Spirit that shall lead and guide you in all truths, that shall be with you. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm with you always to the end of the age. And listen, when you sense that the Lord has moved, he hasn't moved, you have, because he's constant. He is always the same yesterday tomorrow and forevermore. Amen? And so I'm going to stop there. Let's pray. Pastor Corey, if you would come on up. And we will pick it up. I really thought I was going to get through 54 verses this morning. (laughs) So we'll pick it up in verse 5 next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you as Jesus stated with Raising Lazarus from the dead, Lord, that you always hear us. Father, your psalmist declares that you hear the cry of your people. And Lord, all we have to do is cry out to you. Lord, cry out to you in truth and in holiness. And Lord, you are just a faithful God. Lord, there is none like you in all the earth. Lord, you are worthy of all that we have. Our entire being belongs to you. And Lord, may we honor you not just with our words, but also in deed. Father, we give you the praise, honor, and glory because you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name I pray. And all those who agree, say amen. Amen, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. I will send the address out for the 24 hours of praise for next Saturday from 1 to 2 o'clock. If you have never participated in that, it is awesome. Don't forget about the mystery dinner uh, for Ended. 7 p.m. Saturday. Uh, it is a 70s theme, by the way. You know, I already got my bell bottoms and my great Afro wig, you know. And so we're going to have a great Saturday. Have a wonderful week. And in the words of that famous comedian and poet George Wallace, I love you, and there ain't nothing that you can do about it. Amen? God bless you. <laughs>